Good afternoon or good morning, good evening, depending on where you are in the world. And welcome to Presenting to Global Audiences, our first webinar for 2017. Um, welcome back, those of you who were with us last year. It's nice to see lots of familiar names, unfortunately not faces for us, but nice to see you back with us. And welcome on board to those of you who it's your first webinar with us. I'm just going to do a little bit of an introduction and take you through some housekeeping. I do the boring bit and then I'll hand over to Jackie who's going to guide you through the session today. Um, so just a little bit of housekeeping before we get started. Unfortunately, you're all on mute. We're not going to be able to hear your voices or see your faces. We have a, a large group joining us today, so it just makes it a little bit easier to manage. But that said, we, we do try and make the session as interactive as possible for you. It's great to see some of you have already started using the chat and introducing yourselves. If you prefer to be a silent witness, that's absolutely fine. But if you'd like to get involved, then please, please don't hesitate to make comments, ask questions. We will also just um, give you the opportunity from time to time to respond to questions. Um, We'll either use the chat, which you're using already. Sometimes we'll ask you to annotate the slides. So perhaps we can just have a, a little practice for people who haven't done this with us before. On the left of the screen, you should see a toolbar um, with various icons. There's a T about three down. If you click on that, that gives you the option of using text. So if you'd like to try and write a little message on the slide just to make sure that works for you, please please go ahead and do so. Lovely. You also, if you're feeling more creative, you have the option of using a pen and doing something a bit more freestyle. There's something, um, I think on mine it's the first, and if you hover over it, it tells you it's a marker, and that enables you to draw something. It was Valentine's Day yesterday, wasn't it? So I'll, I'll draw a little heart. There you go, you found that as well, lovely. The only other thing we might ask you to do is to put your hand up in response to a question. Um, so across the top of your screen, you should see a little, a little icon with a, a person sticking their hand up. I can see some of you are doing that already. Let me ask you a, a quick question just to test it. Take your hands down for me. Um, can you put your hand up if you can hear me loud and clear? Wonderful. That's what I like to see. Great. Thank you. So like I say, please join in. Um, it's a lot more fun for us and for you if we have a little bit more interaction. Um, let me just carry on with my housekeeping. We are recording the session. As those of you who have been with us before know, we share the recording um, normally about 24 hours after the session. Feel free to share it with any colleagues who you think might find it interesting who haven't been able to join us today. And otherwise, let me not talk anymore, but I'd like to hand over to Jackie. She's one of our um, expert communication skills trainers, teaches presentation skills, but also presents at conferences herself. So I think she is going to share some of her own personal experiences as well as some best practice. And I'm sure all of us present to some extent, whether it's to a small team meeting or whether you're actually presenting to hundreds of people at conferences. I think sometimes the challenges are the same. So hopefully there'll be something here for everyone this afternoon. The, le the webinar lasts for about an hour. So I think Jackie's going to talk now for about 40, 45 minutes. And then we'll make sure we have lots of time for questions at the end. So I'm going to turn myself off and hand over um, to Jackie and leave you in her capable hands. So thanks, Jackie. Over to you. Enjoy the session, everyone. Great. Thanks very much, Kathy. And hello again to everybody. Uh, it looks like a very interesting group of people here. And I'm keen to uh, hear from you as much as you are going to hear from me. Um, I wanted to start first by just sharing a little bit of how my experiences of presenting globally. Um, for many, many years, as Kathy says, I've been a communications trainer and I've helped a lot of people from different backgrounds, different industrial sectors on um, making their presentation skills more effective. 
But at the same time, I have to say, I felt a little bit of a fraud, really, because the whole time I was telling them what they should and shouldn't do. But in fact, I'd never really had to do it myself. I'd never worked in real business, just work with people from business. Uh, but then uh, quite a while ago, I got my chance to test out my skills personally because the company I worked for uh, asked me at very short notice to attend a trade mission in Serbia. And I found myself in front of a very big group of HR directors and uh, company owners and even um, the ambassador from uh, Serbia. And that was when I found out really what you have to do when presenting globally. Uh, luckily, I got through the time and I actually enjoyed it. So hopefully some of the things I learned, I'll be able to share with you today. Can I just check by a quick raise of hands that I'm not speaking too quickly for some people? Is the speed OK, everybody? Can you put your hands up if it's OK? Brilliant. Thanks a lot. Uh, just don't want to um, be talking too quickly, which is something that you do when, of course, you're on a webinar and you can't see people's reactions to the way you're speaking, as I am today. OK, I would like to start then by asking you um, if you would, in the chat, just write down very briefly what challenges you face yourselves in um, presenting to global audiences. We've got some very interesting and different responses here. That's great. Um, seems to be ranging from your own communication style to um, engaging the audience. Clarity of message. Yep, good. That's lovely. And interaction with shy people. That's interesting too. OK, thank you, everyone. Um, that's just given me a, a nice handle on what we're going to talk about today. And so I'd like to stop that now, if we can, um, and just quickly present my objectives that I think. Are so it's going to be looking at your own existing style and how you might need to change it or adapt it to fit with the different nationalities that you will be presenting to uh, in the future. To understand a little bit more about how uh, culture can really impact on your audience's expectations and how to deal with that. And finally, um, hopefully a few practical tips for being more effective in your presentation. Right, I'm going to keep you working. What I'd like you to do now, please, again in the chat, is just to write one word or one phrase which you think describes an excellent presenter. Hmm. Great, the word engaged is coming up a lot. That's very, very interesting. Um, and we'll talk about how you can do that across cultures. While. Okay, eye contact, interesting one. Powerful, that's a good word, powerful. How do you really have an impact on your audience? And we've got clarity and enthusiasm too, so that's great. Okay, good. So to recap on what I had written down before you even started, um, it's about professionalism too, isn't it? So I do come across people who say, well, my assistant prepares all my templates and uh, the information and I just deliver. That can be good, but of course, um, 
you need to check that the information stays up to date and even spelling sometimes because when you're working in a different language um, you're not always aware of the spelling mistakes that can come up uh, also that the materials are really relevant to the audience secondly of course it's about speaking clearly and using the right language for your audience and as you all have said already engaging them and answering questions to the best of your ability that sounds rather obvious but i actually went to um, a presentation last week about funding for export and the guy who was responsible for giving us information really couldn't answer the questions he had a scruffy piece of paper with some notes on and spent the whole time mumbling his apologies for not having the answers and i could see around the room how people were really not impressed with this type of presentation also it's about of course varying the way you speak how fast how slow whether your voice moves up and down, which I'm doing a little bit now just to show you. Um, and yes, who's there to put in their empathy, Marcus? Right, you can use your voice to create empathy, obviously, and to really get the, comp the audience to um, engage and warm to you as a person. And finally, it's about understanding the needs of your audience. I see some of you are still typing away, which is great. Um, the, the list goes on, I suppose, and it's good that you're all aware of these things. But I'd like to um, boil it all down really to the four Ps. Now, if we look at the first of these, preparation, it's firstly about being familiar with the technology. And I don't mean like now with webinars, but even just knowing how your own uh, laptop works or how the microphones and everything are going to be set up in the room so that when you do stand up, you're really confident and ready to go. But it's about choosing how your slides will look. I've tried this time to use as much as possible only images avoiding that over text heavy slide which can be really boring and of course people have a tendency just to sit and read what's on there so it's up to you and how confident you feel but it can be very effective just to have some really good images instead of lots and lots of writing at the preparation stage you also need to think how many slides am I going to include? Can I reduce them? Can I step away from this death by PowerPoint and present my information alone and perhaps with stories or anecdotes of your own? Also, it's a good opportunity to research the cultures of the nationalities that you're going to speak to. Uh, there are plenty of sources on the internet, fact files about countries which you can turn to to find out the do's and don'ts, the business etiquette, for example. And of course, you should really have an opportunity to practice before you deliver. And if you're really lucky, find a colleague who could give you some honest feedback on how they see your presentation. Okay. The second P is purpose. And I think it's really, really important not only to think about why you're doing the presentation, but making that in a statement very clear to the audience when you deliver. So what are you doing? Are you informing? Are you training? Are you selling something? And this is really important for the audience to get a handle on why they have to be there or why they've chosen to be there. And at the same time, your language then, if you're selling, you would be thinking strongly about how to influence people. So 
a push or to pull with your language, to ask a lot of questions or just to tell people things. They respond obviously in different ways to these two different strategies. And the third P, process. Now there's a lot of debate about agendas. Um, some, some countries that I've worked with, I think especially Germany, the corporate culture tends to like to have an agenda at the beginning of your presentation. It gives clear structure. It tells people exactly what to expect in terms of content and of course timing and when or when not to ask questions. It is up to you, of course. I don't myself very often put in an agenda, but it's something to consider very much, I think. Um, and for your own confidence and, and reassurance, it's good to decide, am I going to let people interact and interrupt me? Especially if I don't feel very confident in the language, then maybe you want to state at the beginning um, that you'd like to keep all the questions to the end. But some cultures like to feel that they can interact and interrupt during a presentation. Others very much expect just to be told and they are much more passive in their role. So that's a, a, an interesting thing to think about, how you want everything to work. And of course, clarify your own um, role. Are you mentoring? Are you training? Are you advising, consulting? So that people are very clear how they're going to react, uh, interact with you. And I think this quote is a really good one because it's true. Human nature is that we, we judge people by the way they look and what they say. Uh, so if from the beginning, aha, that's sorry, I've just seen this comment from Auntie. Why didn't you write something? Okay, <laughs> very good question. <laughs> I thought that it would be a great idea not to write something but to try and run through it in a structured way. And maybe that didn't work. What do you think? I'm going to risk asking you, should I have written something about these things or was it okay just to have the pictures? Okay, just talking. Oh, thank you. Yeah, that's a good point, Steve. Um, it's okay for the English, but maybe not so easy for other non-native speakers. Okay, so that was um, a risk I took asking for your opinions, your feedback there, and it seems like it was it was all right, good. Okay, so back to this slide about people and what they think of you. Here, I just wanted to point out a few things about, for example, dress code. Some cultures really expect you to be dressed smartly. Others, it's okay to be more casual. Of course, it depends on what the situation is and who your audience is. If it's peer to peer, I'm sure you don't need to put your suit on to impress them. But it's also about posture, how you're standing, how you gesture, use your hands uh, while you're speaking or how you don't. And um, how do you create presence? How do you really make people see you as a confident uh, presenter? This I think has a lot to do with um, perhaps breathing techniques before you start. If you do breathing exercises before the presentation, it's uh, quite well known that it will increase your volume, your voice 
um, and how loudly you speak. And it does quite a lot for your confidence, actually. So maybe it's worth considering doing some breathing exercises before you begin. And I often film my clients when they're doing their practice presentations. And it's amazing when you show them themselves afterwards how miserable a good proportion of them are. It doesn't take much to smile. And I think whatever culture or whatever nationality you're talking to, uh, it really helps if you can smile. And I'm trying to do that in this camera now. <laughs> OK. So the fourth P, people. And there's a lot, I think, here that's interesting for all of us when we talk about people. I said earlier that we should research the nationalities, but it's more than that. It's trying to find out, if possible, who exactly will be in your audience. What is their position? Are they decision makers? Why have they decided to come? Uh, and that can be a really interesting um, thought to put into the way you present your own material. Be culturally sensitive. That's something that is obviously very important for all of you here. So that means thinking about what is acceptable how people um, think and work. I'm going to look at that a bit more in a moment. And what your style of communication is perceived by others, how you're perceived. Are you very direct, as somebody said earlier on the chat? Maybe it's too direct for some people. Or are you one of these people who um, has a lot of emotion in their speaking? We've said a lot about engaging, so I'll leave that one. We've talked a little bit about the language level. It's important always to select the language that you use um, with regard to the competence of your audience. That might mean that you choose more simplistic words, but definitely words which are common, well known. Somebody earlier in the chat uh, mentioned idioms. I personally think that idioms are quite dangerous um, because it's, it's not easy for everybody to understand their meaning. And of course, related to that is the use of jargon. There is one company I work with um, a lot, and they have lists and lists of acronyms and abbreviations that they fill their slides with. And that's just really difficult for people to understand. So bear that in mind, too. OK. So now thinking about the audience expectations. Um, culturally, there are a few dimensions that are interesting for us to look at today, starting with high context and low context. Sorry about that. Um, what we mean by high context is people who are very much relationship oriented. And for them, communication is often implicit or intuitive. So messages are uh, understood through the situation. And in contrast, low context people are very much task oriented and they like to talk very directly and about facts and figures. Then, of course, there's the dimensions of big picture and detail focused people. I think that's really quite self-explanatory. Big, big picture people are really looking for an overview, a summary of what's going on. 
whereas those who are detail focused need to understand with lots of detail. Then there are the people who like the key message first. Um, that's quite often those from the low context cultures because for them it's all about getting the facts and understanding what's going on. And in contrast, in high context cultures, they prefer the key message to be at the end and to have a lot more background to what's going on. Okay, and then finally, how humor is valued or not valued. And I mean really in the business context here. Um, professionally, there are cu cultures where it really isn't regarded as suitable to be making jokes in presentations and others where humor, because it's relationship um, oriented, is valued as a way of getting through to people and building rapport. So I'm going to th go through this in a little bit more detail in the next few slides. Uh, firstly, we could say that high context countries in the main tend to be hot ones. Um, we'll, we'll look at that in a minute too. So uh, not related to the temperature or the climate or anything, they generally enjoy having a story. So if you can make your uh, content into a story, that will be well received. That means adding in personal anecdotes or just making the flow of content into really a progression, a journey. I've put in here, maintain harmony. Um, sometimes people think it's quite cool and trendy to put in something a little bit shocking in terms of images. Uh, and that's really not a good idea. Sorry, yes, I've got a question here about hot countries. I do really mean hot as in with a warm climate. So it would be South America, um, the Spain, Italy, parts of Europe where you have a warmer climate. Okay, and cold tends to be the other Nordic and um, say north of, of Europe. Okay. And um, high context cultures, people need to like you. So that goes back to this, um, how you actually present yourself, but also you need then to build a relationship with them and um, make it as personal as possible because then you will gain the trust and it's easier to work with them. In contrast with the low context countries, as I've already said, they're very task focused and they want facts and figures, meaning then that you might need to have a lot of very simple black and white bullets, statistics, graphs. They like to have uh, information presented in this way. So focus on the task what needs to be conveyed to them. And I've put here that credibility is what leads to respect. So you do need to be a credible expert to have correct facts and figures presented in a very professional way if you want to gain their respect. Okay, enough of me for a moment. Just to see um, quickly, we have the slide Ah, nope, I've done it wrong. Let's skip it, sorry. Uh, on the slide, you can see two boxes now with high and low context. Can you write on the slide your country and which side of the box you think it will be in? Thank you. That's using that T that Kathy told you about, if you can. Oh, great. Italy and Brazil in the high context. Good. Netherlands and Sweden. Russia in the middle. I don't know if that's um, 
on purpose, but that's an interesting one. I don't know who wrote it, but OK. UK low context several times. Good. Which is interesting because someone's put it in the other side. So Germany with a smile. That's great. <laughs> That's lovely. Actually, the person who wrote Russia in the middle was a, was a good idea because going back to the UK, I would put UK rather in the middle because obviously we can't generalize and there are some people who don't fit into the categories. But I would have said that the UK was more in the middle um, than extre one extreme or the other. But OK, that's great just to have a look at that. <laughs> now I need to flip back because I accidentally went too far. And of course, now I can't clear what you've written. But anyway, um, so we had a lot of comments about engaging, how to keep people engaged. And if we think of them in terms of their two different uh, contexts, I suggest that for high con context cultures, it's good to use rhetorical questions wherever you can, meaning that we say things where we don't actually want an answer, but it's in the form of a question. Uh, let me think of an example. Um, it could be, did you know that um, too many people in the UK are overweight. Okay, I'm not looking for a response, but it's a question to engage my audience. Also, it's good if you actually direct questions at people. Sometimes you need to plant someone in your audience to make this possible, but it then means that the audience feel really included and they welcome that. It helps you with the next point, which is creating rapport. But again, as I said, creating rapport comes really from you as a person, being able to put the warmth into your presentation by smiling, by engaging, by eye contact. And I think personally that using visuals with high context people works well because they can come to their own conclusions, they can use what they see to decide how they feel about something. And on the other side, it's really about this respect and being a credible expert, but using data more than imagery to engage your audience. You can talk to them as professionals rather than on a personal level. Uh, it's not a good idea to be too personal with a low context culture. OK. So skipping ahead. Now thinking about the those people who are big picture or detail focused, I just put on here a few sort of common comments that I hear. And that's, um, for example, if you have very dense and detailed slides and you just read them, what's the point? Uh, it's a little bit rude in a way because you could have just sent the slides to the people and left them to read them. It really does involve uh, steering yourself away from being too detail focused if you're working with people who are more big picture oriented. But if you don't have enough data for the detail people, you'll have things like where's the data to back this up or get to the point if you're being too uh, long winded or wordy. OK.
And then talking about your key message, it's very much uh, again linked to high and low context cultures. Um, actually, I've really covered this point, so I'm not going to dwell on it. But think where will the message be at the beginning or the end, and how will your audience expect that to be presented? High culture, high context cultures like the message at the end and low context cultures generally speaking like it to be at the beginning okay it's all about getting to the point and humor i think this is quite important too um, because if we think about differences between the very obvious British and American humour. Um, Brits have, I think, very often a great ability to put themselves down, to make jokes about themselves, um, which is OK, but it's not always understood by other cultures. And the American humour is very often um, a little bit more what we call uh, dare I say this, childish. It's different. So you have to think whether your sense of humour will be accepted by the other cultures. And of course, um, some cultures just don't like to have humour in their presentations, especially the low context cultures, because it's not seen as appropriate or professional. So think about whether it should be there at all. And uh, I think the first final point, while I'm just waiting for Jeff's um, comment, is will the joke itself actually translate? And I'm sure you've come across a lot of situations where you tell a joke to somebody and it really doesn't work in another language. So that's definitely um, a point. That's good. So Jeff says he loves humour in presentations. Right. And he understands the British sense of humour. Very good. OK, thank you for that. Now, this, this uh, slide, um, I'm going to apologize up front for this because it goes against everything I've said about making your content easy to read. But to be honest, it's quite difficult to simplify it down any further than this. Um, but I wanted to show it to you because it's an interesting thought. Do you actually know? how your style uh, is perceived by other people. And I'm not going to spend time on it now, but because you will receive these slides um, after the webinar, what I'd like you to do really is to try and put yourselves on these um, spectrums here. So what, you're not going to necessarily be all down the left side with those styles of distance, formal, complex, etc. There'll be um, times when you're a little bit personal or a little bit formal, depending on the situation that you find yourselves in. But the reason for really doing this is to, as I said, firstly, understand how other people see you or see your style. But then to think, is my style appropriate to the people in front of me? Do they understand it? Do they get who I am? Maybe they really don't. If we take the example of people who are very formal, and if you are very informal in your style of communication, it could be perceived as very inappropriate. Uh, with not enough attitude to respect and hierarchy. If you are very direct, which some people have already uh, mentioned, and you're speaking to someone who prefers an indirect style, 
they again could even be offended by your directness. So this is a great time to do a bit of personal analysis and think, do I need to adapt just slightly or a lot to the people I'm speaking to? And what I would do is mark yourself on those lines and then find someone who knows you really well and ask them to do it as well and see then, are you really aware of how you communicate or do you come across differently to other people? Okay. I just need to grab a bit of a update here. So uh, moving on from the actual verbal to non-verbal, uh, a couple of points then about things like eye contact. In southern cultures, eye contact is very, very important because it's an element of building up trust. So now um, I have my camera in front of me and really, according to research, I should be looking directly in the camera at all times so that it seems like I have eye contact with you. That's actually quite hard to maintain. But it's something that you should be aware of, whether you're face to face or online presenting. Try not to look away because people feel then that you are not 100% engaged with them. As I mentioned before, it's about facial expressions too, smiling um, and even a little bit perhaps moving inwards towards people to build rapport. And gestures, an interesting point from a story a long way back, um, how you use your hands. In the picture with your, your palm up, I once had um, a group of very lively teenagers as I was working with, and at the end of a session, they rushed out of the room. And I put both hands up and shouted, stop, come, calm down, be quiet, everybody, and was met by gasps of horror. I thought they were play acting a little bit and I asked them what was the matter and found out that in Greece, where I was working at the time, doing that is very, very offensive. So going back to the cultural research, it's a good idea then to look at um, what gestures may or may not be uh, taboo. I've got a question here from Steve about universal um, view of eye contact. I would say more or less yes. Obviously, there's um, important issues with, um, for example, Arabic ladies who um, you're not supposed to look at. But to be honest, I found that they are not... Um, always allowed to attend online presentations anyway with male presenters so it's a difficult situation um what does anybody else think on the on the chat is eye contact universally necessary Okay, Veronica says, I believe yes, it's very important. Thank you, Veronica. And Auntie too. Okay, good. So, I'm coming to the end of the talk now. And for me, um, I wanted to make a particular point about native speakers. I see there's still a lot of, of chat going on about eye contact, but I'm aware that uh, time is moving on. So I'll let you talk to each other. Um, Non-native nightmare I've put here because as native speakers who um, 
often forget that others aren't able to understand everything we say, I think it's really, really important to think exactly about how we speak to a non-native audience. A great example I had actually is years ago, I used to be a host family too for students coming to um, do some English training in the UK. And after a few days, they would say to me, Jackie, I think my English is very bad because I can understand you, you're a teacher, but your husband, I can't understand anything he says. Now, the reason for that were multiple, really. Firstly, he is a Yorkshireman with a Yorkshire accent that's quite difficult for some people to understand. Secondly, he told very complicated stories with a lot of idioms and a lot of expressions. And the more people didn't understand him, the bigger and more complex the story became. And he really found it difficult to see that people just didn't understand his story. So I wanted to ask you, non-native speakers, who I can see there are a lot of, could you just write down in the chat um, some of the things you think us native speakers could do to make your lives easier in presentations? Hey, it's great. We've got Marcus talking about speaking slowly. Yep. Don't use slang. True. OK. Yes. And local expressions. Thank you, Francesco. That's true. Um, what we call dialectal differences or things which relate to our local news and stories that just haven't been heard. Exactly, Marcus. Thank you. <laughs> And Oleg, yes, pronunciation, that's true. Um, we speak too quickly and we often don't open our mouths clearly to enunciate or to say the sounds in a familiar way for other people. And Steve, you've got leave spaces to catch up with your internal translation. OK, that's an interesting one. You're obviously working online a lot. Great, that's lovely. Well, what I've done then is what uh, we in the training world call the Ten Commandments of International Language. And um, I'm not going to go through them all, obviously, but I think that's something that we should all bear in mind when we are presenting to people who don't speak our language uh, as a first language. Oh, and Ole Oleg's written um, problems with the Scottish. Yes, the accent is very difficult for some people to understand. I appreciate that one too. OK, uh, so that leads me to any questions. And I think there was actually a question on the chat. Um, I don't know, maybe Kathy to come in here. Hi, Jackie. Thanks so much, Jackie, first of all. We will have some time for questions, but I just wanted to thank you, first of all, for covering so much ground in a short time. And I think it's so important, isn't it, that we put ourselves in the shoes of our audience and really think about what they want from the presentation rather than what we think a good presentation is. So, yeah, thank you. And yes, there was a question. It was from Bruno. Um, I made a note of it, but it's um, how important is nonverbal versus verbal communication when it comes to presenting? Mm, right. <laughs> um, again, I think that for high context cultures, 
it is probably more important because there is this whole idea about the emotions and the, the relationships and you can convey that with the non-verbal um, just as well as verbal. Perhaps it's not quite so important for the low context people. Great, thank you. An interesting one from, from Dirk, one of our colleagues here, and I think as many of us when we work internationally, we need to use an interpreter. So how can you avoid that kind of disconnect of stopping for the interpreter? How can you make it flow better when you're working via another person in effect? Wow, yes. <laughs> um, that's something I hadn't really had experience of, but I suppose my first thought is that um, before you present, you need to have worked together on this and find a way that you can know exactly how long it will, or roughly how long it will take for them to translate uh, and find a way to fill those gaps or to pace your, your talk so that it isn't so disjointed. What do you think, Cathy? I mean, I think there's what you said, but also something about finding the right size chunk. Mm. So you're not stopping after every sentence, but you're not waiting so long that um, people have switched off because they can't understand what you, the presenter, is saying. And I think that comes back to the preparation and having a connection with the interpreter is important as well. So there's there's a bit of chemistry Mm. on the stage or on the podium as well. I don't know if that helps, Dirk. Um, we have got quite a few questions coming through still, I think. Let's have a look. Ah, how do we start a presentation well from Francesco? What's a good way of opening? Ah, so if you're not going to use jokes, um, <laughs> that's interesting because I was practicing with a French lady last night and she she came across very much like a little mouse and she won't mind me saying that because she agreed and i think this is where you need to have taken that big breath and really go in with a confident beginning who i am and exactly what i'm here to do um there are lots and lots of uh so we say language gambits out there that you can look at but it's about yeah who am i and perhaps that little story like I used at the beginning to help people connect. Yeah, I think a lot of, um, I'm sure many of you have watched TED Talks and I think in their brief to their presenters, they always say start with a question, a story or a joke, which is more or less what you've said, Jackie, isn't mm. it? So if you're not familiar with TED Talks, they're a great source of um, just watching great presenters, but also there are many talks on how to give a good presentation, which are worth a watch. Um, let's have a look. What else have we got? There's one about resources. We'll try and send you, um, Asa, some, some follow-up resources in our email tomorrow. But if you Google, you can find an awful lot on, on cross-cultural styles. But let, let us send you a couple of things through. Interesting one from Steve. What about mm -hmm. thoughts on having the PowerPoint in the local language but doing the talking in English? Um, I think for certain nationalities who are, um, can we say, more hesitant about using English, that, that could work. But at the same time, I w would worry about confusing things if the um, translation isn't 100% correct uh, and timing. I would say it can work if, as you said earlier, the text on the slides is fairly minimal. Mm. And also, I think as the presenter presenting in English, you still need to have a bit of an understanding of the slides in their original language, otherwise there really will be that disconnect, mm. would, be, would be my position on that. Um, let's see, how are we doing? I think that's more or less all the questions. Anyone yeah. else for any last questions? I think there might be one more coming yes. through. Oh, you've had a compliment on your mantelpiece, I that's know, always that's good. good. <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps while people are typing the final questions, I just wanted, ah, there's one from Pfizer. Let's have a look. Yeah. I've been to conferences where there are two screens with each language. Ah, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, good idea, actually. Yes. Thank you, Pfizer. 
We don't normally send the PowerPoint, but let me see if we can on this occasion, because I know there are some nice tools on there that we can, um, you know, share with you. So we'll we'll try and send that separately from the follow-up email that we do tomorrow. Before we finish, I know we're almost out of time, but I'd just like to um, let you know about a couple of things coming up in the next few weeks. They're actually both on the 1st of March. We're going to be very busy that day. So our next, um, let me just jump forward. Our next webinar is um, a country specific one next time. So it's very much about um, working in Germany. One of our presenters who is German but has lived in the UK for a long time is going to be breaking down some of the stereotypes that perhaps we have. So a great one for those who do business regularly in Germany or are looking at an expat assignment in Germany. Um, so that's a great one for those of you who aren't in London, perhaps. But if anyone's in London and wants to know a little bit more about what we've been talking about today, we do run a full day course on this same topic. So we have a, a one day course on the 1st of March here at our centre in, in Holland Park in West London. And we are offering a um, discount, a promotion for anyone who's been on the webinar today. So if you're interested, either let me or, or Pfizer, who's also on the um, webinar today let us know and we can look at booking you a place or giving you a bit more information but I think if there aren't any more questions I'll wrap up now we'll send you the recording you'll get the slides and a few other bits and pieces from us obviously if you have any questions that we haven't been able to answer just drop us a line and we'll do our best to come back to you and otherwise Thank you again, and we look forward to seeing you on one of the next webinars. Bye-bye. Bye, -bye. Bye now.